can participate in harmonics, and in fact, there's a Clears and Nature Communications that gives a little bit more details about this particular case. Okay, so, so we learn that that process of tunneling out that leads to harmonic generation can itself be thought of as an impulse. Okay, uh, let's do a few more things with that idea. Okay. Um, I'll come back to the electronic orbitals in a minute. Right now, let's concentrate on something that's a little easier. That is the, uh, the uh, vibrational and bending uh, motion. Uh, here's water. Water looks like this. This is the uh, highest occupied molecular orbital, and water sits on either side of the plane of the bent water. I suppose some of you already knew that, because it's certainly one of the most well-studied and well-understood uh, systems in molecular orbit theory. And, and, and the, the, the uh, HOMO minus one, the, the next most highly bound, uh, most weakly bound uh, occupied orbital, that is the one that's next down, is, it looks like this. It's actually in the plane of the water, and it's the electron that provides the glue that shields these protons from each other to allow the water to be bent. Otherwise, it would be a linear molecule because the protons want to repel each other. So why shouldn't it be linear? And the answer is HOMO minus one forces it to not be linear, forces it to be bent. Okay, that's kind of interesting because it means that we already know we can, depending on the orientation of the water, either remove this electron in high harmonic generation or remove this one. But if we remove this one, actually, of course, there are two, it's a closed shell. But if we remove this one, one of those, uh, the water's going to want to unbend. Actually, that's, a, yeah, that's, that's trivial, that's well known. That's, the, that, that's this uh, potential energy curve where the HOMO minus one is the orbital you remove, and this is the bond angle. And 180 degrees, when our bond angle is 180 degrees, the molecule's straight, right? Here's where it likes to live when it's in the ground state of the neutral, and here's where it would like to live if you remove the HOMO minus one. You see, that's the minimum, okay? So if we can remove this one, the molecules will start unbending. Okay, when they unbend, here is a little cartoon. When they unbend, they are now in a different state when the electron comes back to make high harmonic radiation. So we can see this, this uh, Im impu the impulsive uh, aspect with respect to the bending motion simply by looking at the high harmonic spectrum for water uh, as a function of different parts of the spectrum. This should be this should affect the blue part of the spectrum much more than the red because the blue part has the longer trajectories which are much, much, come returning much later. Okay. Well, okay, the, 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 the poor man's experimental approach to testing that is to try this for H2O versus D2O because they have exactly the same electronic structure but the, 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 the protons are twice as heavy, right? To go from protons to deuterons, so it unbends slower. And to look at the ratio of the harmonics on the red and the blue part of the spectrum for D2O versus H2O, and it's a huge effect. It's a 15% effect, uh, simply because it's so probable to ionize this HOMO minus one orbital. And then you get into this impulsive excitation of bending. Okay. Uh, all right, so we talked about um, exciting superposition states of vibrations just by tunnel ionization. Of course, we already know that we can excite superposition states of bending or vibration with short laser pulses, but now we have this new insight because of this, because of this, uh, this snake oil that I'm attempting to sell today. Because if that pulse is short, then it has coherent bandwidth, then it is impulsive with respect to levels that are within that bandwidth, and those are the vibrational emotional levels of, of, a, of a molecule. Now, now, this can actually be, be, be controlled even just by the Frank Condon intervals. That is, if I have a short enough laser pulse, I will excite a lot of, mode, a lot of, uh, of, of different uh, uh, bandwidth up here just because of the Frank Condon intervals. 
And then my system will start to move. Now this particular picture is for a whole experimental program. I'm not going to explain it based on the physics of the particular program, which involve you know conical intersections, all kinds of nice stuff. You know, it would it would be it would be a, if if they allowed us to give four lectures, I, I might talk about that. But now just think about the motion. It's just the motion. I'm exciting coherent motion because of this of, of, of this impulsive limit, and I can now probe it. And here the idea is I'm going to probe it with X-rays. Okay. So. How does this work? Well, this molecule is very complicated. It's called thymine. It's a DNA base. It, it's got a ring. It's got nitrogens. It's got oxygens in addition to the carbons and hydrogens. And, and when it gets excited, one of its bonding orbitals, like these guys here that are holding the ring together, one of those pi orbitals gets excited to an antibonding state, like a pi star state, where now that place where the molecules were being held together is being pushed apart. That's the excitation. That's what causes the molecules to move. Here you see it moving because of it. Okay? Uh, because we can do this impulsive excitation, we can ask, uh, what's the overall time scale for the motion? Which states are populated? And how does the geometry change? And, and our, our method to answer some of these questions is to probe it by x-rays, which will concentrate their effect right over <coughs> atoms, individual inner orbitals in atoms. So we chose an oxygen atom, we excite this moving state, and then we probe it by removing an oxygen inner electron. And depending on where the molecule has moved to, that leads to an OJ decay that will have its energy shift dramatically. So it's like an amplifier. So I have a little bit of motion. It's an angst motion. How can I see that? I can see that by sending in another pulse under an impulsive limit that removes an inner electron, suddenly changes the charge over here, not anywhere else in the molecule. And then the Auger relaxation will depend very, very strongly on where the other electrons are with respect to that place. And since the molecule is moving, that's what's changing fast. And I should be able to see that in my spectrum. And you can. This is the electron kinetic energy from the Auger process versus the delay between the excitation and the x-rays. And you see the Auger spectrum suddenly shift. Okay? It, blue means, means less, red means more. So there are more Auger electrons coming out at a high energy and then suddenly they come out to a low energy. And you can, you can uh, analyze that, where that's coming from. Here's the oxygen atom. This is the oxygen atom that was that, that where everything must be happening. It means that, that the electron cloud is moving with respect to this oxygen atom. And you can relate that directly to the geometrical move of a molecule. So, you know, rather than give a whole lecture on this, I'm just giving you the snapshot. The bottom line here is that any kind of molecular or electronic or coupled molecular or electronic motion is now open to you to view directly with the probe because we got into this limit. All we did compared to previous experiments at synchrotrons was have the pulses be short enough to be in the impulsive limit and look in the time domain to see the motion directly. You can also do this with two x-rays. We can induce the same kind of coherent motion with an x-ray by say, take a simple molecule like acetylene. Acetylene is is HCCH. Acetylene is a linear molecule. It's kind of interesting. If I do HOH, that's water, molecules bent. HCCH, molecules straight. Okay. What, a, what a difference that central core makes. It's really, really critical. So that's a straight molecule. It doesn't stay straight once you start removing uh, electrons. And so we do a two x-ray pulse experiment. They're both very short. One comes in and does whatever it does. In fact, what it does is it removes one of these carbon electrons. Here's a picture of it. Like. Removes one. And then later, a probe delay comes in, and it removes another. Now, 
I have two electrons that have been photoionized. I have two relaxation events in between, two Auger events, and I have a four times ionized molecule. I have four atoms in this molecule. It can fly apart a la Paul Corkum's Coulomb explosion. I can then look at the direction of the momentum and the energy of the particles and reconstruct the geometry. And again, the, the bottom line is, by being in this impulsive limit, I get to look at the geometry of the molecule. In this particular case, the thing that we cared about was that when you remove a couple of electrons, the molecule really wants to have one of these protons, in this case it's a deuteron, because we wanted to slow it down, one of these singly uh, charged uh, atoms move over to the other side to form this isomer of acetylene. It's the smallest molecule that can isomerize, has to have four atoms. And uh, it's actually OCS, OSC, Anyway, so this one isomerizes. And you can see that. You can see it happen here as a function of time delay over a few femtoseconds. This looks like lousy data, but and it is. But it, 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 uh, it demonstrates the principle. That uh, you can see uh, isomerization of the pulses are short enough. Okay. So let's now get into the regime of X ray ionization. When X rays ionize something, as you've heard from Linda, uh, there's a very strong tendency for the ionization to be an inner shell. Right? Just a cross-section thing. The way more electrons up here, way fewer here, doesn't matter. The cross-section is so much bigger here, orders of magnitude bigger. So you tend to ionize. Nine electrons will come out this way before one comes out this way, something like, like neon. So it's a pretty good bet that you ionize a core, a core electron. That means all of the other electrons think that the atomic number of one of the atoms that, that is holding them together just went up by one. That's, that's, that's basically what they'll think. And they'll respond really fast. Okay? So you can see this response uh, in calculations. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a simple calculation that was done by the Cedarbaum group for a number of different atoms and molecules where their idea was, let us let us make a, a, a I, I like this group because they really get the impulsive idea. They said, let's make something, the limiting impulse that we can possibly apply to it. The experimentalist can't even touch this. It's so impulsive. We will simply erase one of the electrons at t equals zero. And then let the system evolve. OK. Not only is it a clever idea, but it's also like really easy. right? It's an easy thing for them to do. And, and, and what they observe is that no matter what the system, if they look later and see whether that hole they created has survived, it doesn't survive. I mean, it does survive for a long time, but it, it starts to fill in right away. In fact, it starts to fill in in as little as 25 nanoseconds. For any of these cases, this is krypton. They didn't even go to 1s. They went to the krypton 2p. They, here's a, here, here's a, 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 the one pi u CO2 state in the three pi state in, in this, you know, methyl acetamide. Uh, and, and, and it's just a kind of a universal thing. So you want to go out of science, impulsive x-rays seem like a good bet. Okay. So we have to sneak up on this problem because uh, we don't have a 50 out of second kilovolt or even 100 volt. Well, maybe we do have 50 at a second. But, you know, it's sort of at the limit of what we can do. So, so uh, one can look at this in various ways. One is that, let me just, let me just do this in a molecule uh, where I remove this and then the OJ happens and I'm left in, uh, after a couple of femtoseconds, in a doubly excited state. Doubly excited states of nitrogen are interesting. Some of them are kind of almost bound. And a lot of them have very significant quasi-vibrational levels, quasi-bound vibrational levels. A lot of them do. This one does. These are all of these energy levels as a function of intranuclear separation and the nitrogen dication. They have, of course, the diatomic molecular symmetries. Okay? 
And we can ask the question first, was it really impulsive in the sense that we made all of these states? And the answer to that one, that's a trivial one, the answer to that one is absolutely it's, it's true. And, and then ask the question, if we make them, can we get coherent vibrational motion? Because obviously it must have been impulsive with respect to these vibrational levels. And the answer there is, in order to see that, we would need to have very good time resolution in our pump probe experiments, which we don't yet have, but you know, that, that's probably there as well. We, we have actually tried to do this by probing with an 800 nanometer laser, and it's kind of in, inconclusive because the pump probe jitter has to be minimized to reveal it. But we're sneaking up on that, okay? Of course, the real idea of going to x-rays would be to look at something that happens very fast, like charge migration. Charge migration, as we saw, is supposed to occur in half a second. And, you know, would, would there really be a science payoff? At some point, you have to ask yourself, if your field is, is, is out of second science, at some point you, you have to ask yourself, are you really just messing around because the technology is now advanced to where you can make these things, but actually it's hard to learn something new? I, I ask myself this question. So let me make a pitch that you can learn something new with me in the impulse limit. What, we know that charge migration initiates all of charge transfer chemistry. That is, that is, first an electron moves, then other stuff happens, okay? And an electron, and the first thing that happens in, in charge migration is that all the other electrons, you know, to the extent that I can think of this as the electrons are distinguishable, of course they're not, but I have this fiction that they are, and I can move one, or move one, and then the other ones all relax around. Okay. There is a, a classical theory of electron response where it's, it's as simple as it could possibly be. It's, a, it's a called Marcus theory. He even got he was even a Nobel Prize for it. And that is that you can think of, of, of all of the electrons as living where they live because they're in some generalized sense at the bottom of some parabolic potential well. And if I change anything about this molecule, uh, like photo excited, for example, then I displace that potential well to some different potential well, and the molecule is no longer in the bottom of a potential well. It's now way up high in a potential well, and it's got to relax. Oh, this is such a simple idea, it can't be wrong. Right? And, 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 and the uh, opportunity and challenge, particularly in theory, for this out of second charge migration stuff is that is that this is, this is the only bar you have to beat. This is actually considered the current, this is the, this is the way one should think about charge migration. So let's do a better job, uh, and that'll be great. So I think there is, a, there is a strong motivation to be able to, to work on this problem. So we would like to work on this problem as well from the experimental side. So we have to construct these sets of very, very short pulses to interrogate our system. And, and the, the, the rule, again, is that each one of these has to be impulsive with respect to the energy scale that we care about. And then we can do multidimensional spectroscopy. So we, can, we can create through, for example, if one of these does core excitation, it can create a localized electron disturbance, and then there'll be some relaxation, some non-local electron transport which we can then, then probe, okay? Now, an even, a refinement of this idea, or I should say a subset of all of the ways you can do this, is to have those, uh, impulsive, uh, those, those impulses actually not just suddenly change the system, but a change the system in a strong field way, that is, undergo a Raman redistribution. So, this solves a very important pro problem, a conceptual problem, in photo excitation physics. Is if I'm trying to take a system and it's from its ground state and put it into an excited state, that, if I want to do that resonantly, then I'm kind of <coughs> stuck with that resonant frequency. But if I'm trying to do it impulsively, then that resonant frequency is got to be in the middle of the bandwidth of my 
pulse, which is sort of impossible. That means you have 100% bandwidth pulse. If you do it using strong fields in a Raman way, then the central frequency of your excitation can be way up here, much higher frequency. And it's easy for it to have enough bandwidth to cover all of these states. So Raman then becomes really necessary to get into this impulsive limit. That, that actually also has an advantage, because since this is a two-photon process, whereas all of the background processes, like direct ionization, are one-photon processes, uh, I should be able to go to high enough intensity to get the two-photon process to actually dominate. So we did a little, you know, this is the thinking we go through. So we did a little calculation for, for sodium to find out where this would happen in inner shell ionization, uh, inner shell excitation using Raman and sodium. And, and, and you know, there, there are certainly regimes where you're at 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 watts per square centimeter squared. Should be accessible. We should be able to get to those intensities if we choose the right system. So notionally, it's not a crazy idea to go in this direction. So here's, here is a, a test case. So this is a, an excitation in the sodium atom. And uh, the sodium has some resonances way up in the continuum at high harmonic type frequencies. This is photon energy in EV, 32 to 40. Okay? And we can, we, can excite, uh, we can excite sodium to, uh, double, to, to, to inner shell excited states embedded in the continuum in this range from 36 to 38. And then we can drive the 3s electron, the one that used to be the outer electron before the excitation, back down to fill the hole. That's the Raman process. So the Raman process is we can go from, from 2p6 3s, that's sodium, to 2p5 3s ns. The 3s is still there. And then take the 3s electron and send it back down. That's the Raman process. You end up with a neutral that is in an excited state. And the time it took you to do it is short compared to the entire width of your sodium spectrum. So that's an impulsive excitation. If you want to think of it, that's the, that's, that's the sort of technical detail behind kicking a sodium atom so hard that it becomes an excited sodium atom rather than become ionized. It's a swift kick that is required, right? If you kick it slow with that much momentum transfer, you'll just ionize it. If you kick it fast, It'll stay neutral, but be, but be excited. You have to kick it fast compared to the natural dynamics of the 3s electron. What's that dynamics? It's given by this energy splitting. Okay. That's the idea. That's all there is. Clever idea. Actually, if you do the calculation, you, know, you get some really interesting looking stuff. This is for a Fourier tra transform pulse that I'm going to use for Raman that has, that's a few femtoseconds long, one femtosecond, Three femtoseconds or five femtoseconds are these three dotted lines, okay? And you see that if I ionize uh, my system with a five femtosecond pulse, let's start there. That's the blue dotted line. So I'm going to tune a five femtosecond pulse all the way across this band. It's V V high harmonics. I could do this. Anybody could do this with high harmonics. Tune across this band. You see, you don't get very much ionization. You get some. But then you get to these resonances and you get a lot more ionization. If I make the pulse only three femtoseconds long, I get ionization. It's not getting smeared out by the coherent bandwidth of my three femtosecond pulse. One femtosecond long, it's just a big blob with a bit of an enhancement because of those auto-ionizing states. That's the ionization rate in a real calculation. What about the Raman rate, the rate for Raman distribution, the really fast kick? Well, Start with the five femtosecond pulse. Five femtosecond Raman, that's the solid blue line. Okay? It's down here, 12 orders of magnitude down from the top here. So with a five femtosecond pulse, it's so long, you never leave the system excited. You're kicking it too slow. It's like taking the cowbell and putting it into a crusher instead of hitting it. Okay? You're kicking it too slow. It won't ring, right? Okay. Make it three femtoseconds long, and things get better by six orders of magnitude. Big deal. 
It's still way below what you need. But suddenly, at one tenth a second, this is what Raman does. Raman actually beats, by an order of magnitude, ionization. That's all. That's all there is to this. It's just kicking something fast enough. You can get the neutral excitation you have. So we propose that this is a good thing to do. Okay, here's what we need. Five microjoule, transform linear pulses, 35 dB, one femtosecond full width half max. And here is the Maru chart, or the Moore's Law chart, on what people have been able to make with high harmonics. Midori Kawa is getting 500 nanosecond pulses. That would be good. At around the microjoule, we're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting into this regime. Probably in the next few years, we can actually do these kinds of experiments. Which means it's perfect time, if you are interested at all in this impulsive stuff, to start calculating what would be interesting to, to look at. So we're getting into this regime. The first paper on this, uh, uh, Shungu Mayabi is the, is the theorist. Uh, from, he was actually from, from uh, our Pulse Institute, who uh, worked on this with me, but you know the, the, the whole landscape is wide open for this. Can we do this with free electron lasers? Now we're getting down into the hundreds of dB or kilovolts. And the answer is yes, you can. Nina Roeringer actually proposed it already, kind of, although she didn't have this impulsive idea in her mind. She was thinking, oh yeah, Raman's a good thing. She's right, she's right, it's a good thing. But impulsive Raman, even a better thing, she wasn't quite there. Her idea was two-color Raman should work. Excite and de-excite. What happens if you go to one pulse that has several EV of coherent bandwidth? This is this idea that we call TIGER, because you have to have an acronym in anything with X-rays. Uh, transient impulsive giant electronic Raman. Yeah. Tell all your friends. Uh, anyway, so here's what happens if we have one type of second pulses in this region of, of, of around nitrogen uh, Raman excitation in, in, uh, in, in, with, with x-rays. And the same calculation, at what point does ionization beat, at what point is ionization beat by Raman? What point is Raman better than ionization as you go up in intensity? Now we have to get up to around 10 to the 18 watts per square centimeter. Sounds horrendous. But you just heard how, from Linda, how X-ray lasers can be focused to 10 to the 22. So this is, again, within the regime, if we can get the bandwidth enough. And, and so we have real schemes for this. I'll, I'll skip over the scheme and show you something about the pulses. OK, can we make out of second X-ray free electron laser pulses with that kind of bandwidth? And the answer is sure. The answer is we're probably already doing it, but we don't have good ways to control it. Here's a scheme, for example, that back in 2009, Yuan Tao Ding uh, published about how with a, a small amount of uh, playing around with the electron beam before it enters the undulator, you can make single spike radiation that's 100 attoseconds in width with powers of still in the gigawatt range. So we're still able to focus it. And then this is what, this is what I like the best. This is something that just came out uh, from Jerome Huang's group. He points out that at free electron lasers, if you can really mi do the micro-bunching, how many people remember all the way back to my second lecture what micro-bunching is? Remember micro-bunching? It's kind of a cool idea. Jerong realized that micro-bunching is so tight that even though these electrons are relativistic, it's so tight, you actually get some space charge chirping just because of the micro-bunching, which hadn't previously been thought about that much. And you can make use of that, because it now means you have more energy spread in your electron beam. If you taper the undulator, you can get different parts of the undulator to laser at different energies with the same micro bunches. And then you can recompress them back to make even shorter pulses. And he just points out, this is just natural. This is a great thing about free electron lasers. Everything happens for free. Uh, the machine cost a billion dollars, but everything else happens for free. And, and that, that we're, we'll be naturally making 200 out of second pulses under a, a range of conditions in these machines. So the machine is going to be ready for us to do these things. Maybe. And we have to convince people that they should operate in the right way. So is yeah. this, this space charge is for the current operation? Is it happening now? It, 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 it probably, probably is in cases where they are allowing the micro-bunching to evolve at the, at, at the right rate. It probably is. 
density is not that high, right? And, and as you mentioned the other day, they're really heavy, these electrons. Oh, oh, that's right. But don't, okay, that's a really interesting thing that you just said. Yeah, they're really heavy. That means that it's very difficult to accelerate them or decelerate them. But it doesn't mean that it's very 